What's up, Freedom Church? How we feeling, how we feeling? Great, great, great. What's up, everybody? My name is Justice. I'm the lead pastor. If you're new, it's so great to meet you. Hope you feel right at home. What's up, everybody who's tuning in online? We got a lot of people online right now. We got people in New Mexico and New York and Texas. Hey, if you're watching from Texas in the chat, why don't you just put how much you regret moving there this last six months? Just put it in the chat. <laughs> Just tell me how hot it is outside. If I ever one more person tell me like, oh man, moving to Texas was the best decision of my life. You don't lie in church. Don't lie in church. You know that place is awful. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Acts chapter 16. We're gonna talk about, um, I think, something that's pertinent and relevant and practical for every person here. I don't need a show of hands, but uh, I would just say if you're going through a hard time today, I think you came to the right place. I think you're gonna walk out better than you walked in because God's gonna do a special work and he's gonna show himself to you today. And uh, the only way I know how to do that is um, by asking him and inviting him. Um, Would you bow your head, would you close your eyes? Let's just get our hearts right. Um, Lord, we just pray, Lord, we're sinners. We need your help. And um, we 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 need you to show up in a way that actually brings clarity about our life. We want to live a life that honors you, God, and we need direction and we need guidance. And we pray that over these next just few minutes that we would have just a miraculous encounter with you today, God, that we would encounter the living God and we would walk out of here different because of you, Lord. We're not here just to learn more about you. you. We, we, We wanna know you, God. So we ask for that help. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Acts chapter 16, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them to be stripped, beaten with wooden rods, and after they were severely beaten, then they were also thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them in the inner dungeon, clamped their feet in the stocks. How's your week going? (laughs) How's your week going, okay? Look at these guys. These are the guys that were thrown in prison and I don't have time to catch you up on it, but not for something they did wrong, but for something they did right, okay? So these are two OG followers of Christ. Uh, they, are, they are first century followers of Jesus. They're hardcore. They're, they're doing the work, man. They're telling people about the love of God, the hope of Jesus. They upset some people, mob. They throw them in prison. Now this jailer, this jailer's job is to make sure they don't escape. So he puts them in the, dungeon of the prison. You guys know where the dungeon is in the prison, right? It's the bottom. That's the worst cell. That's the one with no windows. Are you with me? They're chained up. They're in there. They're not going to escape. And here's the thing about jailers of Roman prisons like this. You know, if you're in the military, you probably don't have the longest lifespan, but the guys that uh, make it to the end, the guys who are kind of aged out, these are the most hardcore. These are the roughest and the toughest. They wound up putting those guys in charge of the prison, okay? So they, they have a, this Philippian jailer, he's kind of mean. Not only does he put them in the inner dungeon, these are nonviolent offenders. Are you with me? They're just Christians. Here they are in the worst cell. And it says that he also puts their feet in stocks. You know what stocks are? Stocks are like giant wooden handcuffs that stretch your feet out. And they're not for the purpose of you not being able to escape. You're not going to escape the dungeon, okay? You're not going to escape the chains tied around you. They're just to straighten your legs out and just to torture you. It's just a torture device. So here they are being tortured on some level at the bottom of a dungeon. It's dark. It's smelly. Dungeons where they put people where they intend to just leave them there for a long time and forget about them. Are you with me? And there they are. And it says that around midnight, Paul and Silas were whining complaining, crying, whimpering, Paul yelled out, verse 25, I don't know if this is in yours, but Paul yelled out, why do bad things happen to good people? Do you guys have this one in there? Um, blaming God, pointing their finger at God. Are you guys reading this with me? Might wanna bring your Bible to church. You don't know what I'm gonna say, okay? This is, I'm, I'm being facetious, I'm being sarcastic. What does this really say? It says that these two Oh, geez, around midnight. Why midnight? Why aren't they sleeping? Because they're being tortured. That's why they're not sleeping. Their feet are in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. 
Praying makes sense to me. I would be praying too. But singing, come on, singing hymns to God, worshiping God, singing about how good he is. And it says here that the other prisoners were listening. Hey, turn to the person next to you and say, the other prisoners were listening. The other, I don't know how many prisoners there were there, but down in the dungeon in the bottom cell, dude, there was some music coming out of there. Their feet may be in stocks, but this musical instrument right here was not trapped, and it was letting out some praises to God. And they're praising God and singing, and the other prisoners are leaning in like, what? What is going on in the dungeon? If they were whining and complaining and whimpering, would they be listening to them? No, they'd be like, that's the last thing I want to hear, and they'd be plugging their ears. Like, I don't need to hear more of that echoing through the chambers. No, it's the way they responded during this incredible hardship that got the attention of all the other prisoners around them. If you're taking notes today, the title of the message is Christian Atheism. To believe in God, but complain like he doesn't exist. Just a quick show of hands. Any complainers in the house? Just real quick up and down. Any complainers in the house? Just so I know I'm not alone. Some of you guys, some of you guys complain over little things, right? And you're annoying and we can't stand you. This little complaining, I'm telling you, nothing worse than a complainer. You know what I'm talking about? Don't elbow your wife. Don't elbow your wife. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, complaining does not make my day better. If anybody else complaining, you know what I mean? It's just, if my kids complain, good God. I'm like, are you kidding me? And I give you an allowance? I give my kids allowance. I allow them to live in my house. Any parents? <laughs> no? Yeah, so the, 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 the complaining is going on. I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, the prisoners are listening, here's my point, because of how they're responding during this incredible hardship. And if they had been responding like everybody else, would that have got their attention? No. No, the thing is, we think that when we're doing well in life, when we're succeeding, when we're winning, when we're experiencing victories in our faith, we think that that gets people's attention. But can I tell you something I've learned? Nobody cares. I mean, I care about your life. Your mom cares about your life, but no, but not that many people care about your life. They care about their own life. Are you with me? Their focus is on themselves. And it's like, oh, let me just post this about how great I'm doing. The only reason why you got, that's a courtesy like that you got right there. That's just a nice, that's just they got to like it because everybody else is liking it. And then they, they're going to see you later. You know what I mean? But it's like, I got a job promotion. I did a thing. I love that. <laughs> I did a thing. <laughs> and all this stuff, you know, and I like it and I, I love it. I love every time you're celebrating because I love you, right? And I, I you know, if you, if, if, you, if you got a job promotion, if you're having a baby, if you, I love it. If you want to put your body transformation pics from 90 days ago and you want to tell the world, I will, I'll love it. I'll, I'll repost it. I'll tell everybody about how great you're doing in your fitness journey. I love it. But honestly, that is not what gets the attention of the world. The world leans in when they watch you going through a hard time just like them, but you're respondingly, responding differently than the way they respond. You guys wanna have church today? Dude, Christian atheism is when we believe in God, but we complain like he doesn't exist. When we just keep complaining and we act like the world, Philippians chapter Two, verse one, do everything without grumbling or arguing. One translation will say complaining. Do everything. Come on, say everything. everything. I got this really expensive software that helps me study the Bible, and it shows me the original language. And then I got these ancient scrolls delivered to me from, uh, um, from Nantucket. And then I got um, <laughs> this special magnifying glass, and I, like, zoomed in, and I was studying, like, everything. And the word everything in the original language, you know what it means? Everything. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Do everything without complaining. Everything. Anybody trying to get convicted on a Sunday morning? Do everything so that you may become blameless and pure. You hear the transformation. Children of God without faith in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. He says, you want to shine in a dark world? Then just don't complain like everybody else. The, I don't think you heard me. We are in a dark and hopeless, 
prison called this world. Anybody? And some of you here today, you're in a dungeon. You're in a dungeon with finances or family or health or strained relationships or your marriage or your kids aren't talking to you or your whoever, whatever's going on in your life. And you're like, Lord, here I am. I'm at church. I'm in a dungeon. I need you to deliver me. And you're crying out to him. And God loves it when you cry out to him. But the world listens when you keep your mouth shut. The world listens. He says, you will shine bright in a dark world if you just don't act like them by complaining and arguing. You want to shine? You want to have a life that demands an explanation to the world around you? You want to be a bright star in a dark place? You want to light it up? Then when you go through hard times, don't act like everybody else. Act like Jesus and watch the prisoners lean in all around you. Man, I just, I want to be like this. Anybody else? I want to be like this so bad. I want to be able to go through hard things and number one, keep my mouth shut. Anybody else? Good God. But I also want to be able to, my wife laughed too hard at that. Um, I also want the honor of going through something hard and other people watching me and then me getting to take that and point that situation to Jesus and give him worship and glory even in the hard moments of my life so I can look back on the season that I was in and be like, you know what? I wouldn't have chosen that for myself, but it was worth it. But it was worth it. I just thought of a story right now. This is so crazy. So like I remember, I remember like, I don't know, close to a year ago, I was mountain biking with my friends and I parked my truck down by the trails and um, when I came back to my truck, it was gone. Yeah. It was one of you, wasn't it? <laughs> Joke's over, guys. It's been a year. Give my truck back. Um, and it was gone. And I had some friends with me that were new, that were mountain bikers, right? And they're all like, dude, where's your, where's your truck? I was like, I don't know, man. And uh, <laughs> my friends saw it happen. This is a true story. And they said, they said, how come you're not freaking out? How come you're not going crazy? If this was my truck, that would be like the end of my life, you know? And I got in that moment to just kind of point them in the briefest way to Christ. And then one of them said, if that's what church is like, and that's what, I want to come. And the next week, four of them came to church. They drove an hour to get there. And then the next week, they came again. And they brought their sister. And five people gave their life to Jesus. One of the guys was living with his girlfriend. He wound up marrying her and adopting the girl that he, was a single mom that he was dating. Adopting the daughter. Yeah. The whole life changed. And I'm like, is that because I didn't just act like everybody else when my truck got stolen? Is that because I didn't freak out about it and act like it was in the end of the world? And then my buddy texted me the other day. He goes, it's been a year that I'm following Jesus. I just want to say thank you for getting your truck stolen because that's why I'm a Christian now. <laughs> He's like, and I was like, you know what? It was worth it. It was worth it. You know, it was worth it. I feel like you should help me with a down payment on a new one, but it was worth it. I just wonder if what was said 2,000 years ago to the early church when they were going through much harder times than us, can I get a witness, is still relevant to each of our lives today, that when we keep our mouths shut, if we just don't complain, if we can just endure, we will shine like bright stars in a dark world that's looking for hope, that we will be a beacon of hope. We will point direction, right? I wonder if there's a God who says, listen, I know you wouldn't choose trials for yourself. I know you wouldn't choose hardship for yourself, but I'm gonna let some things happen in your life for the purpose of other people to see how good I am in your life. You know, I, I noticed something following Jesus. It's a lot like this. Anybody else? This is following Jesus for me. And the reason why is because Following Jesus is not about following Jesus where I want to go, but it's about following Jesus where God wants me to go. And he leads me places I don't want to go. The difference is, you know, life, Jesus is following Jesus is like this. Life is also like this, right? So, you know, you're looking at life, you're looking at a Christian, everybody's facing trials. 
Everybody's going through a hard time. Everyone's got hardship in their life. The difference is in our ups and in our downs, God's with us all the time and we sense him. And he can take that pain and use it for his glory. He doesn't have to waste it. So we can look back and say, man, I, I, you know, I'm not where I want to be. Come on, I'm glad I'm not who I used to be, right? So we, we have that journey. It says here that God uses trials to transform us. That's what it says. So you can become pure and blameless children of God. Now, James, he talks about a specific kind of hardship. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about four different hardships. Come on, say hardship. That we go through, and all of us in here go through hardships. Whether you're following Jesus or whether you're just kind of figuring out if you want to follow Jesus, you're going to have trials in life, right? One of my favorite theologians, Rocky Balboa, anybody, <laughs> says nobody hits harder than life. So life's coming at you. Uh, um, would you mind turning this around for me, Alfonso? Would you just zip up here and, and turn this around for me? Thank you. I'm going to give you four different types of hardships. And the first one starts with a T. And it comes out of James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Come on, say joy. joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Say trials. trials. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. First hardship. First hardship we're going to talk about is trials. I don't think we're going to get to all four of these today. Don't worry. But trials is the one we want to pay attention to today. Now, how do you know if you're in a trial that's coming from life, or how do you know if the devil's attacking you, and how do you decide what you're, how you're going to respond to one of those situations? Because we know that the world sends trials your way, the enemy sends trials your way, and sometimes God allows some things to go on in your life on purpose too. And so you have to go through a process, and I believe this will be helpful for everybody here, of prayerfully discerning what kind of hardship you are in. Depending on the classification of hardship, I think you will, you'll figure out how to respond differently. And you'll, I, think there's diff, I think there's four different types of dungeons here. What kind of dungeon are you in? And the way you determine that is called discernment. Say discernment. discernment. Do you know what discernment is? You know what prayerful is? Prayerful means to pray about it, right? To get God involved. I was talking to a friend the other day, and he was going through a really hard time. And I said, well, what's God saying about it? He goes, you know what? I probably should pray about that. I was like, yeah, pray about it. Don't you know that God cares about even the smallest of our problems? You know why? Because God cares about you. Oftentimes we think, oh, our God's so big, how could he care about such small problems? No, it's because our God is so big that he can care about such small problems. If it's important to you, I'm willing to bet it's important to him. Pray about everything. That's what the scripture says in Philippians 4. Pray about everything. So here we go. Hardship, four different categories. We're going to talk about trials today. Prayerful discernment will help you figure out which type of hardship you're in. The word discernment is a word that really means figuring out what's really going on in the spiritual side of things, okay? So discernment can be a gift. There's some people in life who are just extra discerning. Anybody married to somebody who's extra discerning? You know what I'm talking about? Like, man, I can tell you my, my, my wife, she, just know, she can just read the room. She can just read people, you know? And after I tell you this story, you're gonna... I don't know if you're going to look at it differently. But um, I remember one time when we first got married, um, there was this friend that I was hanging out with, and he had his own business, and he was, you know, successful, and he was a great guy, and I would just spend a lot of time with him. And she said, you know, honey, I don't know if hanging out with that guy is such a good idea. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she goes, yeah, he, he doesn't seem like a very trustworthy person, and I get a bad vibe. I'm kind of discerning something there. And I was like, I was like you know, you're so judgmental, Maria. <laughs> I was like, yeah. And then I was like, why would you even say that? And she goes, because I look at the people that he's hanging out with, watch this, I look at his friends that he's hanging out with, and they're radically immature. And anybody who spends that much time with people like that, is not, you're not getting the full story. And he was trying to be somebody different in front of me than who he really was. And it turned out that guy was an absolute crook, and he brought a lot of heartache into my life, and I wish I would have listened to my wife. Anybody wishes they would have listened to their wife the first time? Anybody else? <laughs> Listening to your wife, listening to the Holy Spirit, these are good things to practice. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how she knew it, except that she is discerning. Discerning is this. Let me give you the formula if you're taking notes. Wisdom, say wisdom, wisdom. plus experience, say experience. experience, plus the Holy Ghost. Come on, say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. That was your chance to say Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Equals discernment. Wisdom plus experience 
plus the Holy Spirit. What's wisdom? Wisdom is knowing a thing or two, right? Experience is having gone through a thing or two, right? Who's the Holy Spirit? He's your helper. You put those things together. Wis discernment is not just some magical feeling you get. It's not just some radar you get on things, okay? Should I do this business deal? Let me check the Holy Spirit. Mm, no. No, get some wisdom before you do the business deal. Talk to somebody who's done a deal like that. Get some experience, right, before you do something like that. Oh, you know what? My, my boss is a jerk. I'm going to jump out of this job, jump into the next one. No, no, no. Make sure you're discerning the right move at the right time. Are you with me? Not just running off with what you think is this door that's open for you. Do the due diligence on that. And part of due diligence as followers of Jesus is wisdom. The scripture says wisdom comes from the counsel of many, experience, right, and the Holy Spirit. Pray about it. You do that with the hard thing that you're going through right now, no matter what it is, relationships, health, finances, family, you do that with that, and you're gonna figure out which category to put this in, and then we're gonna go from there. So I want you to think right now about the hardship that you're in. I want you to picture that thing that you're going through. Some of you came to church today because you're looking for God to deliver you and rescue you and help you and bail you out. And I'm just gonna tell you, God loves it when you come to church looking for help. He loves it. Now, he wishes you came to church when you didn't need help, but he also loves it when you came to church looking for help because he loves when you draw near to him, okay? So you're here at church, you're trying to figure out, you know, I need some, I need some wisdom, I need some experiment, I need some discernment, I need to figure out what to do. Now, is it a trial that you're going through? Is it a trial? If it's a trial, did I already read James chapter one? I started to. Consider it pure joy, say joy. My brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, many kinds of trials, aka many things will try your patience, right? Many things will try your character. Many types of trials, right? The first trial I think of, just a good old-fashioned trial, is health. Anybody got anything going on in your health right now? Like you got a sickness in your body, you got an undiagnosed situation, you got health, you've been dealing with some chronic pain, you just got some health going on and you're just like, man, how long am I gonna have to put up with this? When am I gonna go back to normal? Is it always gonna be that way? When I think of trials, I think of health situations. And there's probably not a person in this room that's been in that situation where they're just in a health trial. And what does James say is the secret to trials? Can you read that? What does he say? He says here, Consider it pure joy. Joy is an attitude, guys. It's a decision to respond. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance. Perseverance is an attitude. It's a choice. It's how I'm gonna go through this trial. I didn't choose this trial, but this child chose, chose me. But what I can do is choose my attitude. And I can choose perseverance, which means not give up. Not give up. Some of you here right now, you're close to giving up. You're close to giving up. This trial's been going on way longer than you thought. It was, you didn't, if, if you could never imagine having gone this far with this thing already. And here you are and you're like, man, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm tempted to just break down. Can I tell you? You're always tempted to break down before you break through. Man, breakthrough is coming for many of you. And this scripture right here says, Get that attitude lined up. Make sure that attitude is the kind of attitude that God can honor. I believe that when your attitude is lined up with the character of Christ, God will accelerate your trials. I think that some of you are in a dungeon and God's gonna break you out. And as your attitude lines up with him, he's saying, you know what? Let's speed this thing up a little bit. I think I believe that with all my heart. My friend, um, my friend Mike Johnson, I don't know what it is, but I have people in my life that are going through a hard time. And some of them are pastors on our team. And Mike Johnson, I don't know if you know him, but he's uh, been a pastor at our church for many years now. And he, about three years ago, got cancer. And uh, it was just awful. I know his family super well. Molly's a big part of our church. And his son, MJ, is the, our youth pastor. He was out here a minute ago. And um, his daughter, Micaiah, is big part of our life and uh, love this family so much. And the first time they got cancer, we're like, good God. And we journeyed through it with them. You know what I mean? We were there with them. You know, after about a year, 
he conquered that thing. He overcame that thing. But it was a stinking trial. And I watched the way he handled it. And I was like, wow, the way you handle that, it brought people close to you. It didn't push people away. When you go through a hardship and you act like Christ, it brings people in. Other prisoners lean in. When you go through a trial, ask cancer patients who are going through a trial. People act weird when they respond. You know, they don't know how to act around them. It can be very lonely for them. And Mike continued to work in ministry, and he had a job where he ran men's events, Christian conferences for men. It was a very challenging, stressful job where he's doing these large men's gatherings all over the U.S. And about a year after overcoming cancer, and we're all celebrating, he gets the news that he's got cancer again. And, you know, I'm thinking, this is the second time with cancer. I'm thinking you're going to take a break. I'm thinking you're going to pull back, you know, and maybe, uh, maybe slow down on the ministry a little bit, you know, maybe take a break. No, I kept going. And for another year, while having chemotherapy and every other kind of treatment he was having, after one year, he overcame that cancer again. And I said, I cannot believe that you went through that year like that. No, he said, I can't believe that going through a year like that, 1,000 men still came to Christ in that year while I was going through the greatest trial of my life. I said, during the greatest trial of your life, God used you as one of the most fruitful seasons of your life. Get out of here. Does that inspire anybody else? Called me last week. Dude's got cancer again. Third time. Third time. And I called him and I said, this is what I said, because by the way, guys, we don't like to talk on the phone very much. We're not really big phone guys. <laughs> just, I felt like a text message would be, insi- you know, in- would be insi- sensitive, so I called him. And I just said, how's my friend Mike doing? That's all I said. And he said, well, Justice, I got a lot of questions for God. Third time getting cancer. But I'll summarize. He said, right now I'm just focused on getting my attitude right. My attitude, he was telling me, has to line up with who my God is. It has to be a reflection of who he is. Because that's how you get through trials. Attitude. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you go through trials of many kind. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be made mature and complete, not lacking anything. Meaning that there are some things in you that are not complete or there are some things in you that are immature and God knows the best thing for you to do is just to get through this trial and draw closer to him so some of that stuff can be eliminated from your life. Some of that stuff that was keeping you immature, like an attitude problem, will be changed when you get through this trial. God's in the business of changing you. I know we're not in the business of praying that. That's not how we pray. Friends, we don't pray, hey, God, change me. We pray, hey, God, change my circumstances. Hey, God, get me out of this. Hey, God, I need a a way out. I need a change. That's how we pray. I wonder what would happen if we said, God, change me. God cares a lot less about changing your circumstances. He cares a lot more about changing you. Your circumstances are temporary. You're eternal. You're going to be around. You're going to be his son. You're going to be his daughter for a long time. And going through these trials, you wouldn't choose this. Nobody chooses hardship for themselves, but we all get it. If you can figure out if it's a trial then you can figure out how to respond. Best way I know to respond is with my friend, Pastor Mike. Start here with the attitude. I'm gonna tell you, the perseverance side of things, the not giving up side of things, is a whole different game. Whole different game when you have the right attitude. My friend Lisa, Pastor Lisa, she's been with us for like 11 years. Pastor Lisa has been a rock in our life. We used to have three locations as a church before the pandemic, and she was... uh, headed up our Sunland location. She's been with us for a long time. Any Pastor Lisa fans in the house? You know who Pastor Lisa is? She's here every week running our pop-up pantry, man. Incredible encouragement. Maria preached this sermon, or this passage of scripture, excuse me, um, at a a women's conference a couple weeks ago, the same passage, and same story about Paul and Silas. And Lisa texted Maria afterwards. She said, you know, that week she texted her, hi, I wanted you to know what a powerful message you gave at the women's conference. I have reread my notes several times this week, and my rheumatoid 
arthritis has been the worst it's been in years. And now has spread to every joint in my body. The week of the conference, I couldn't move my hands or my feet, just like Paul and Silas. But I kept playing worship songs. And when you said, we can't change the situation, but we can change our response, it really hit home. Thank you for encouraging me to worship in my weakness. Love you. I've watched Lisa keep an attitude that's like Christ no matter what she was going through in her health trial. And she has a, she's, she's a magnet. She's a magnet. People, are, people come to her. People are encouraged by her. I was just looking at a picture of her life group this week. Her house is just filled up with people. And I just wonder how bad her rheumatoid arthritis was right before that life group. I wonder if she was having a horrible day that day and she couldn't get out of bed and she's like, you know what? It's just a trial. These are people's lives. God deserves to be worshiped. I'm not gonna let this trial slow me down. In fact, I'm gonna get my attitude like Christ. I'm gonna persevere, I'm not gonna give up. I, I, I share these examples of Paul and Silas, Pastor Mike, Pastor Lisa. And I preach the sermon to myself. I wanna be like these people. These people look like Jesus and that's who I wanna look like. I don't wanna complain about stupid stuff. I feel like that's offensive. If you complain about small things, I think that's kind of offensive to God's big love for you and his provision for you. The more we complain about little things, I think the more that messes with our testimony to the world. We're, we're Christians. We're followers of Jesus. We believe that the best is yet to come. Our perspective is lined up with the eternal things of God. When we pray, we pray that God's kingdom would come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Trials are part of life, but how we respond is what people are listening to. Nobody cares when we're winning, but when we're struggling, their eyes are on us. You know why? Because they're struggling. Because they're facing their own hardships and they need hope. If they can see a hope in you that's bigger than the problems on you, that's how God gets glory. Let's be the kind of people that glorify God in every area of our life, every season, every moment. Let's be the kind of church family that when we're whining and complaining, we make fun of each other for it. Can I get a witness? Like, dude, you sound like a... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Come on. These are guys are in prison not for something they did wrong, but for something they did right. And in the midst of their torture, they're singing worship songs to God. And the other prisoners are listening. It says here, around midnight, they couldn't sleep. They're being tortured. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open and assumed the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself, but Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. He didn't say we're both still here. He said, we are all here. Who's all? All the prisoners. A massive earthquake hits a prison, which by the way, if you're underground during an earthquake, you, you wanna get out of there as fast as can. Doors are flying open, chains are falling off. I don't know how many prisons were, prisoners were in there, but the only thing scarier than that earthquake to them were the two guys in the dungeon singing worship songs to their God during their greatest trial. People are watching your life and they're listening to your life and it probably is not even the moment you're thinking. Do you think Paul and Silas were praying for an earthquake? No. Do you think they knew this earthquake was gonna happen? We've heard the story before. We think about the earthquake. These guys weren't thinking about that. You think Paul and Silas were in stocks and Paul's like, Silas! Sing louder, sing louder so we can get an earthquake. You think that's what's going on? No, they were responding in worship. And you don't want this, you want this? You want this? 
Dude, we're Christians. We don't worship God because of what he's going to do. We worship God because of what he's already done. They were worshiping God because he's always been good to them. He's always been faithful. Even in their darkest hour, that didn't change who God is. So they were worshiping as a response to Jesus. Their situation didn't dictate their attitude. Their Savior dictated their attitude. They've been saved by grace. They've been saved by a God who loves them and is with them in their darkest and worst moment. And for them, that was reason enough to sing to God about how good he was. And the prisoners, they heard that. And when the earthquake came, they said, we can't run out of here. Do some of these guys were gonna be beheaded the next day. Some of these guys had crucifixion with their name on it. They're like, no, 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 no. The life of these two Christians during their greatest hardship demands an explanation for their faith. And I want that. And I want that. Paul says to the guy leaning on his sword, he's about to fall on his sword. Hey, stop. You mean jailer who didn't need to torture us and put us in a dungeon, but you did. Stop, we're all still here. 2,000 years later, here we are, bringing the smallest bit of application we possibly can to this story, because none of you guys are gonna be in a dungeon this week. None of you guys are gonna save a guy diving on a sword. None of you guys are gonna be in stocks tonight. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna get our attitude right. And we're not gonna give up. And we're gonna watch something as simple as that demand an explanation for our faith in the world we live in today. That's what we're gonna do. If you're here today and you have a health situation going on, I wanna pray for you. If you have an undiagnosed thing, you got some chronic pain, you got, maybe you're fighting cancer and you need God to touch you and heal you, we believe in a miracle working God. If that's you, if you would just so boldly, if that's you, if you have a, an actual thing that you need to be healed from, and you have the faith to, to ask God to heal you. Would you stand to your feet? We want to pray for you. If that's you, you're here, you're facing some sort of health trial, some sort of health trial going on in your life. Can we pray for them? Would you put your hand on somebody who's near you? Just lay hands on them. And for those of you that are standing up, one more time, I want you just to reach up to God. I want you to reach up to God. I want you to say with your physical posture, here I am, God, see me. Here I am, God, see me. Lord, I pray for every one of these precious souls that are saying, here I am, God. My back has never been the same. My arthritis is never, it feels like it's never going away. I haven't gotten an email back from my doctor. I don't know what's going on. I feel fatigued like I never have before. I got stuff going on that I've never faced before. And Lord, I promise today that my, my attitude is gonna change. But I also know that you've promised that you're a healer. You're a great physician and that you enjoy and love showing mercy on us and compassion and meeting us where we are. So God, I reach up to you right now and I ask that you'd heal me. And Lord, I ask that you'd touch every one of their lives with the miraculous hand of God, that they would, we just pray the way you taught us to pray, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in their bodies as it is in heaven. Lord, we know that you can touch them right now and bring a healing power that is from none other than the person of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we ask that Jesus, the healer, would touch them right now. I pray the Holy Spirit would overwhelm them, that every part of their body would sense right now that you are with them, that it's gonna be okay, that you're never gonna leave them. In Jesus' name, we pray this healing, amen. The rest of us, come on, let's stand to our feet. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never said yes to Jesus, you, you, you're here maybe because, like I said, you're going through a hard time and you need, you need God to save you from your, from your situation. You, you need God to heal your heart or heal your bank account or heal your marriage or heal your relationship with your kids or whatever it is. And you came to God because you're looking at Him to fix your problems. Let's start with this. Let's start with your heart. Let's start with you giving your life back to God. If you need a Savior today, I'm just missing in 90 seconds, but this is the most important 90 seconds of our day right now. Because there's people who bring friends and there's people who've been coming to church for a while trying to figure out this whole Jesus thing. But for somebody today, you're saying, I need a savior. I need to be saved from myself, from hell, from my own consequences that I've caused in my life. I need to be forgiven. I need all the promises of God and more. I need a touch from God. I need to be, in Jesus' words, 
born again. I need to start over today. I need to change my life from what I've been doing, and I need God's help to make those changes happen, and He will do it. But it, start, it, just, it comes down to believing if Jesus is who He says He is. If Jesus is who He says He is, then you are who He says you are. And that means that you're a sinner and need to be saved. Are you with me? But when you give your life to Jesus, He forgives you. His work on the cross is for you, and He will fill you with the Holy Spirit so you can overcome any trial, but anything else that life gets your way. Would you bow your head, would you close your eyes? If you're online right now, would you type in the chat bar if that's you, I believe. If you need a savior, you need Jesus to save you, type in the chat bar, I believe. The scripture says in Romans 10 that those who confess with their mouth and believe with their heart will be saved. If you're in this room right now, we're about to dismiss. We wanna give you a free Bible, pray for it if you need it. But is there anybody here today who's saying, Pastor, today's the day I wanna begin a relationship with Jesus. Today's the day I end. I will die so that he can live through me. I want a, a new, fresh start with Jesus. This is my first time ever deciding this, but I want to begin a new life with Jesus today because I have a Savior who will save me from now into eternity. If that's you and you need a Savior, would you raise your hand and say, that's me, I need a Savior. Would you raise your hand straight up? We're with you. I see your hand over there, and we're with you, and we're with you. I see your guys over there, and we're with you, and we're with you, absolutely. And we're with you, and we're with you, and we're with you, absolutely. And we're with you, and we're with you, absolutely. Anybody else? We're with you, and we're with you, and we're with you, and we're with you. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus. We're with you. Let's give it up for what God's doing. Lord, we love you. We worship you. Come on, let's pray together. Would you say, Jesus, thank you. Help me. I love you. God bless you. You're out of here. We'll see you next week. We are so glad that you joined us today. If you're ready to make a decision for Jesus, we'd love to pray with you. We call it saying yes to Jesus because it, I mean, really, this is what we're doing. You're saying yes to a new life with him. Yeah. That comes with a lot of no's, right? It comes with a lot of saying no's to a lot of other things. But if you want to move in that direction, we want to send you a Bible. Yeah. We want to help you on your journey and we want to lead you in a prayer. Want me to do it or do you want to do it? You go ahead. Then you would just, just pray this prayer with me. You would say, Jesus, I recognize that I have a lot going on in my life and in my heart and I need to make some changes. And I know that you'll help me. And so I'm asking for your help. I pray you forgive me of everything that I've done. I do believe that you lived for me, that you died for me, that you rose for me. Will you forgive me of what I've done? Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can do everything that you've called me to do. Amen. Amen. Make sure to text the number on the screen so we can get this Bible to you and journey with you. We love you guys.